So my name is Marlon Palmer, and I work at Lund University to develop stem cell-based therapies for Parkinson's disease. And Roger talked a little bit about the history in the field. Um, and I'm fortunate to work in the center in Lund where this therapy was pioneered uh, decades ago. And here's a picture from the first clinical team. And one of them, Anders Björklund, he's, uh, he's, still, he's in the back there. So he's still, uh, <laughs> his office is next to mine. So uh, I have the best coaching into this field. And also the other people in this picture are still active. So it has really a long, long history uh, in Lund. And Lund was also a transplantation site for the trans euro trial. So you see here the uh, clinical trans euro team with neurosurgists, uh, neurosurgeons, neurologists, and Jenny that prepares the cells. Um, so we didn't transplant the first trans euro patient, but we transplanted the last trans euro patient in Lund. Uh, and uh, it's going to be very exciting to follow the outcome of this. What was also exciting was that at the time that we performed the trans euro transplants, uh, some of the patients from the earlier trials uh, started to die from uh, not related to their transplant. Uh, and we were able then to look at the brains to really see what the cells inside the brain look like. So that was the first time you can get a good look at what actually happens. Um, so uh, it's a quite simple idea. Um, you harvest the part of the developing brain, which is a ventral midbrain here, where the dopamine neurons are normally formed. Make that into a cell suspension. It basically just uh, break it into small clumps of, of cells and transplant them uh, to the area in the brain where dopamine is needed. So these early trials uh, did show really good effect in some patients, uh, where um, a number of them had long-term clinical benefits, could withdraw or reduce their dopamine medication. Uh, PET imaging done in London showed that uh, the dopamine cells that were put in there really release dopamine in a very similar fashion to the dopamine neurons that are normally in the brain. Uh, and because we could tr uh, follow these patients for such a long time, we also know that they survive for at least 24 years, which is a lo uh, the longest grafting time that we've studied. And here's an image from that brain. And you see it's a beautiful, well, it's a beautiful image, and it has been at art exhibitions because just because it's so beautiful. But it also shows a beautiful graft, so we can see how well these cells uh, behave after 24 years in the brain. So this is a graft core labeled with dopamine, so this is where the cell bodies sit. And then a kind of lighter gold is their fibers that go into the host brain. And this is really necessary to get a good effect of your transplant. Now, as we also learned from Roger, not everyone had the same good effect of a transplant. Uh, and this is uh, part of why TransUro was formed, to see if we can get a more robust and reliable outcome from fetal tissue. Uh, and we don't know the outcome of TransUro yet, but I had the cell preparation team in Lund, and I can tell you that even if we have a perfect outcome in all the patients transplanted, this is not a way forward. Uh, for developing a therapy. And this is because of the tissue we use. So we have to source uh, brain tissue from aborted embryos. Uh, very low availability. We had to cancel many, many transplants. Uh, and also there's a high variability because each patient get a different set of cells. So everyone gets cells from at least three, tissue, three fetuses, but they're all different. So there's going to be high variability, and we can't, there's not enough tissue to do any kind of quality control before we transplant. Uh, so this is where my work really comes in. So in parallel to these fetal cell trials, uh, my team, as you see in the top pair, uh, has been working with developing stem cell-based therapies for Parkinson's disease. And we hope to start this stem PD trial, which is a stem cell uh, trial in 2019, or actually 2020. So what is a stem cell? 
Do we have any volunteers? Jeff, what's a stem cell? A <laughs> stem cell can develop into any cell? Yes, and a stem cell can do two things. A stem cell can divide and make more stem cells, and this is what makes us be able to generate unlimited number of cells. And the other thing uh, you can, that a stem cell can do is generate more mature cell types. So that's the two criteria that we say for a stem cell. Now, uh, we have different types of stem cells, and this, I don't think that everyone knows about this, but not every stem cell is the same. So there's stem cells uh, here in the fertilized egg, very early embryos, but there's also stem cells uh, in our bodies when we're born, and every one of us carries around a lot of stem cells right now. And these are called adult stem cells or tissue-specific stem cells. So the stem cells that we have in our bodies, they replenish uh, many of the organ systems that we have. Now, for example, <laughs> we all have blood cells, and the stem cells of the blood are fantastic. They generate like billions of new cells every day. Uh, so this is really great. We actually also have stem cells in our brains, but they actually don't really divide, and they don't generate any new nerve cells. But they do exist. It's just that they don't do uh, anything in terms of repairing the brain. So these stem cells that we have in our brains right now, I give them a thumbs down because they're not, <laughs> they're not very helpful when it comes to uh, therapies. So what we do uh, to create these dopamine neurons from stem cells is that we go back to the very early stages of embryonic development in these embryonic stem cells. And these stem cells, they're what we call pluripotent. So they can make any cell type uh, in, the in the adult body, at least in theory. So these cells, if you have the potential inside the embryo, and also when you take them out, to make all these cell types. So they can make blood cells, and they can make skin cells, they can make neurons, they can make all the cell types. Now, uh, our job is really to make sure <laughs> that they make dopamine neurons. So we have to tell these cells that you're supposed to become a dopamine neuron and nothing else. And uh, this is easier said than done, but we found very good protocols so that we can tell these cells to become dopamine neurons. And what's also very important is to make sure that they don't become anything else. So they tend to be like a group of kindergarten kids. You know, you let them out and they all run in different, <laughs> different directions towards different... You need to collect them in and make sure that they only go one way and that they only go to dopamine neurons. So this is what we do in my lab. And we found then this protocol for making these dopamine neurons from stem cells. And then what becomes really important is, of course, how do they function when we put them in the brain? So these experiments we do in different rat models of Parkinson's disease. So we transplant the cells, and then we can, uh, at different time points, we take the brains, make them into very, very thin sections that you see there, and then we can look at what do these transplanted cells look like. So here you see a microscopic image of the transplant. So this is, so also the nice thing about rats is that we can take away the dopamine neurons on one side of the brain but maintain it in the other. So it's, a, it's different from the disease. But that lets us have, this is the intact side full of dopamine and this is a transplant side where the dopamine neurons are gone but our transplant is filling up almost this whole structure. And if we look in higher magnification with other markers, uh, you see how nice these graphs uh, can look like. So TH in red is all the dopamine neurons in the transplant. Now, if we look at even higher magnification, uh, we can see that they form really mature neurons that look like we expect them to look, that what they look like in the brain and what they look like from fetal cells. Now, the other thing that we measure is their ability to release dopamine. Because, of course, that's what dopamine neurons are supposed to do. Uh, so we can measure that with different techniques to make sure that the cells release dopamine when they should in the right way. And maybe the most important test is then to see if they can reverse behavioral deficits. So I said in our rats, we can take away the dopamine neurons on one side of the brain. And this gives them an asymmetry in their movements. So we can do a rotation test, so here you see a cylinder test. So if you put the rat in a cylinder, they're very curious and they start exploring their environment. So an unleashed rat, a healthy rat, use their left and right paw 
equally much. So if you count, it should be about 50-50. If you take away the dopamine neurons on one side of the brain, they start using preferentially the unaffected part. And then you count, so maybe it's 80-20. And then we transplant our cells, and then we wait, actually quite some months before these cells mature, put the rat back in the cylinder, and then we can count if the use is, is, is if it's back to 50-50 using the left and right part. So these models are really good to predict how these cells will do uh, after transplantation to patients. And we have shown in a number of studies that the dopamine neurons that we get from stem cells, they function equally well as the dopamine neurons that we find in the fetal brain. So on the basis of this, we're moving forward to producing these cells in, under the conditions uh, that makes them compliant with using patients and have set the plan for the safety and efficacy testing. So we're hoping to, the cells are being produced uh, at the moment at Royal Free Hospital in London, and then they will be uh, put through safety and efficacy testing, and then shipped to Cambridge and Lund for transplantation. So uh, this is going to be my last slide, and now we go back to this GeForce PD a global effort. This work is really not a one person or one center job. And I don't think that any of the uh, translational stem cell work would have reached the point where we are now if it wasn't for this network uh, GeForce PD. And I have an even older site from Kyoto, 2017. Uh, and then our European networks. And here uh, I want to highlight uh, Andres Birkeland that uh, was part of, well, actually he invented the field uh, and he's still a very active member uh, supporting the stem cell development. Uh, and Agneta Kirkeby, <laughs> Uh, that has figured out how we get the stem cells to become dopamine neurons and nothing else. And then Roger and Danielle here in Cambridge, uh, that has been our partners in crime in all these, you know, if we knew 10 years ago what we were getting into, I'm not sure we would have done it. Uh, but we did. Uh, and now we're almost there. So I also want to thank, of course, the people in my group in Lund. Um, for being the, the people that work really hard to generate this stem cell data. So thank you very much. <laughs>